Uh, thank you, Craig. Uh, we're in for a real treat. Um, my very good friend Tom Grist has uh, agreed to join us for the day, and we're very fortunate. Uh, Tom has a very, very distinguished career. Uh, Tom received his undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering from Marquette and went on to get his uh, Doctor of Medicine degree at the Medical College of Wisconsin, followed by a radiology residency at Duke. Um, after that, he returned to Wisconsin to become a faculty member of the Department of Radiology, ascended to run the MRI program, and ultimately in 2005, Tom became chair of the department for which he's currently serving today. The department has grown tremendously under his guidance and leadership, uh, always known for great medical physics, but the way that Tom has brought in the clinician-scientist perspective and enriched Wisconsin is something to emulate for all chairs. The current faculty is 93 clinical faculty. There are 25 fellows and 34 residents. Uh, Tom established an imaging science center in Wisconsin that has about 60,000 square feet with uh, tons of cool equipment. Um, Tom is internationally known for his work in magnetic resonance. Uh, he's authored four books, 16 book chapters, and over 170 peer-reviewed publications. And importantly and uniquely, he has 16 patents. And I remember one of the early ones was for a coil. And I think that there's a small, uh, a small little tow rope on his property that maybe is attributed to a knee coil. I'm not sure. But that's for a little skiing hobby that he has on his property, which I am envious of. Um, Tom uh, is, is a fellow of the American Heart Association, of the ISMRM, the American College of Radiology, and the SCBTMR. And Tom served as president of the ISMRM, which is a very prestigious organization that many of us belong to. Uh, I happen to serve in uh, uh, my end stage of the board, so I overlapped with Tom uh, on in that experience. But Tom and I have had the, the really wonderful opportunity, at least wonderful from my perspective, to be overlapping in our careers for a long time, uh, starting with the early days of magnetic resonance angiography, when a bunch of crazy guys got into a room and started talking about how do you squirt gatto and get these dynamite MR angiograms, and how do we convince the world how to do this? And it was our good fortune that we were able to start lecturing together frequently, and sometimes we'd rotate with each other's crew. Uh, I had the good fortune to be able to speak with Chuck Mistretta, who's uh, one of the hi most highly regarded MR scientists who's been a member of, of Tom's department for years. Uh, Tom's also just a terrific person, and, and I think what I always watched was before I became a chair was the way that Tom's faculty really were comfortable around him. And we'd be at ISMRM and the whole crew would be there and you know having a beer and just having a good time. I said, you know what, that's something to admire. Uh, I'm grateful to Tom because when I was considering my move to a chair, uh, Tom was uh, an absolute vital resource and uh, consult and uh, there, too, you didn't get paid, did you? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I'm really delighted to introduce Tom and welcome him to the podium to address us with his talk, Promoting Innovation Within Your Team, Practical Pearls for Pragmatic People, in which you will witness terrific teaching by tenacious Tom. Please welcome Tom. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Neil, for that kind introduction. It uh, really means a lot to me. I mean, we've had a relationship for probably uh, more than 20 years now. And I think if there's one message to the trainees about a career in academic medicine is that um, we make some sacrifices, perhaps in salary, you know, compared to our clinical colleagues in private practice, but the value of these relationships that are built with colleagues from all over the world, in my opinion, 
greatly outweighs uh, anything else and is uh, of really a tremendous value, these friendships. So uh, thanks for inviting me. And um, I had a great day here uh, looking at the department in the morning. And uh, there's really a lot of similarities between our two departments. These are my disclosures. Our, our department gets research support from Brocco, GE Healthcare, Hologic, and Siemens, and, and uh, I serve on some of those boards. And uh, I, I uh, made this slide after I, uh, well, I stole the idea from Neil, is that we need a graphic you know, about what our department is about at the University of Wisconsin. And as I visited here today, it's clear to me that there's so many similarities between our departments. You know, uh, some of that is related to, we're both kind of in the middle of the country, right? And so the people on the coasts are always flying over us to go to the other coast, right? And so Harvard and Hopkins and Stanford and, and the UCSF, they get a lot of the credit, right, when there's tremendous good work being done in the heart of our uh, country. And I think the other thing that I witnessed today was the, uh, the spirit here was, is really remarkable. And uh, I think it's probably related a little bit to uh, uh, the pioneering spirit coming out from the coast, since many of your leadership team came from the East Coast, um, and uh, came out to develop a department where I can feel this uh, palpable energy of everybody kind of uh, appreciating and being involved in different ways in the overall mission. I've known Ron Pishak for m more years than Neil, I think, and uh, it's really, a delight to witness the transformation of the department, which had been, I think, more of a uh, community-based practice now to one that's a, really an exciting academic practice here at UT Southwestern. But the other thing I saw was you've got some pretty unique things here as well. So I had dinner last night, and this is the place I had dinner. Um, the Billy Bass Adoption Center at the Flying Fish Restaurant, which was near my hotel over at the Hilton. And, and you didn't tell me uh, to bring my Billy Bass, but I have one that uh, I could have brought here for, for adoption. Uh, when Neil came up to visit us in Wisconsin, I gave him the Wienermobile, the, the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, which uh, I, th I think I might have seen in your office. <laughs> So uh, the scope of this lecture is to really talk a little bit about innovation, to become a little bit more practical and pragmatic about what we can do to promote innovation amongst your teams. We've seen a lot of innovation already at the research presentations, and um, this is uh, based upon a lot of more recent work, including the work of Walter Isaacson and Joan Allaire. And, uh, also, Clayton Christensen has written about this. Uh, Christensen writes more about disruptive technologies, and I won't really be talking about that as much as creating teams and what we can do to enhance uh, innovation. And um, by many accounts, what we do in medical imaging is highly impactful and highly innovative. And in this assessment by Fuchs and Sox of the um, most innovative and most impactful innovations in medicine, MRI and CT scanning, as you know, came up as number one of this survey of uh, several thousand internal medicine, medicine physicians in 2001. And likewise, within imaging, MRI, you know, is clearly at the hub of innovation and is at the center, and that's as measured by the number of publications, which seem to be at an exponential rate, and uh, the number of patents as well. It's interesting that there was a little dip here during the economic crisis of 2008 and 2009, but seems to be going on a continued very uh, favorable trajectory. And if we look at federal funding of innovation um, as measured by patents as proxies for innovation, the National Institute for Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering is perhaps one of the most impactful uh, things our government has done. If we look at the uh, 
number of citations per patent, which is a good measure of the impact of a particular patent, as well as the um, patents per $100 million of funding to these different centers within the NIH, you can see that the NIBIB here is at the uh, upper outer quadrant, uh, really, for both the uh, citations as well as the number of patents per $100 million. So, so clearly, there's a lot of innovation in medical imaging, but we ought not to take that for granted. And uh, this, if not continued uh, to be supported, could lead to problems. And some of those problems have been observed, um, and one of that observations is in the study of the Torrance kids. And E.P. Torrance set up a study in, uh, of Minnesota children in 1958 and uh, has followed the creativity of children in that region since that time. And in a more recent analysis of the data, Kim et al. in 1990 showed for the first time that there was a decline in some of the uh, creativity of these children. And uh, that has caused some uh, concern and has uh, led to a few publications, for example, noting the creativity crisis uh, uh, that Newsweek wrote about. So my objectives are to reflect on some of the lessons learned about innovation in MRI, understand some of the current knowledge about creativity, some of which MRI has now contributed to through the use of fMRI, and um, suggest how we might improve innovation both as individuals and in small groups, research teams, and in our departments and professional societies, since many of us have, con have the ability to contribute uh, to those areas, uh, to the policy around this in our professional societies. So how can we promote innovation within our team? Let's first of all talk about as individuals and small research groups. And, uh, I uh, look at those as making time for alpha waves, preparing the prefrontal cortex, and then embracing the outsider. And so this first category, making time for alpha waves, this is giving us the time to have that divergent thinking, uh, thinking out of the box. And um, a, a number, there's been a number of common themes on this, and that is in an environment where you're relaxed, happy, and maybe doing something that doesn't require a total attention, but doing something that you love, um, like taking a warm shower. How many of you in the audience have had, uh, you know, a good idea, one of your good scientific or other ideas in the shower? Raise your hands. Yeah, that, that's about the standard rate, about 30 to 40 percent, I'd say. Um, others have said, you know, going for a hike, and this is really taking that time to relax. And, and uh, this is uh, really about the role of the uh, left and right brain. And um, uh, there's research that suggests that uh, there are these alpha waves. And please, you know, Joe, I, I know I'm not a neuroradiologist. I'm just a cardiovascular radiologist. But bear with me on my interpretation of EEGs and fMRI. But uh, basically, there's this work that uh, deconstructed, the, through the use of EEGs, um, individuals who were asked to uh, solve problems and then had that epiphany, that aha moment. And what this team noticed was this burst of alpha wave activity from the right hemisphere about eight seconds before a solution was found to the problem. So this could predict that aha moment. And it's felt that these alpha waves awake these remote associations in the right hemisphere. And this is all a process that's spotting a thought inward more. And uh, this allows us to um, have those epiphanies. And uh, so uh, what is it about these alpha waves? It, part of it's noticed that uh, these are often uh, appreciated during times when we're uh, relaxed and uh, in a quiet environment or relaxed and doing something that uh, uh, allows us to focus inward. 
Uh, likewise, Fink and his colleagues looked at the difference between uh, the alpha wave and fMRI activity in both higher order uh, creative individuals as well as lower uh, ordinary uh, creative individuals and noticed that uh, in fact, that the alpha wave power was significantly different between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere in these higher order uh, creative individuals. And likewise, fMRI data no, uh, localized some of these activities to um, kind of this interconnection between uh, frontal hemisphere and a parietal lobe in the, in the right hemisphere. And in my initial kind of uh, anecdotal research in this topic, um, as one of my talks at the ISMRM, I had the chance to poll uh, many of the gold medalists for the ISMRM. These are people that really made uh, many seminal contributions to uh, the development of MRI. They have an average H, in, H index of 41, average number of publications of 174. Um, these are many of these individuals who have made uh, really seminal contributions through the field. And it was remarkable how many of these had, uh, of those that I polled, had their good idea in the shower. Um, it's not a statistical sample, I grant you that, but I talked and heard from about a dozen of those gold medalists that had their seminal idea in the shower. So does that mean we should uh, take uh, more showers, perhaps? Uh, and I won't talk about group showers. We'll talk about team building later. Uh, but uh, the other, the other uh, time for these alpha wave bursts are also perhaps after a prolonged session of intellectual focus on a particular area that we're interested in. In this case, uh, talking about the ISMRM meeting. And this was also a common theme among the gold medalists. Uh, for example, um, Klaus Prusman had uh, went to Vancouver in, uh, I think, 1997. He, he saw uh, Dan Sodickson's Dan paper on parallel imaging using the SMASH technique. And uh, he uh, went after that conference, after really kind of totally um, focusing on MRI for a week, where we're all excited, we're going to talks, we're uh, interested in exchanging ideas, and uh, I'm always kind of a little bit exhausted at the end of that week. And uh, I think many people in the ISMRM take that week after the meeting for a little time away. The ISMRM, we tend to try to find attractive places to go to around the world, and I, I think there's a lot of value in that. So after that Vancouver meeting, uh, he went on a canoe trip in the San Juan Islands, and basically he and his team, his lab team, were thinking about this and basically said, if, I guess if we didn't go on that trip, everything would have played out differently because his uh, idea for some of what he has done with accelerating imaging uh, was accomplished at that, after that meeting. So there, you can refer to other entities that also provide this time for us to think. And in uh, academic medicine today, we face tremendous pressures for accounting for all of our time between the clinical productivity, uh, educational activities, and research activities. And in some sense, uh, I really think it's a mistake to get uh, completely focused on that. And in academics, I think it's incredibly important for us to provide some unfunded academic time for people to explore their ideas and uh, develop uh, funding avenues after that. So, Neil, I'm sorry if that just cost you a lot of money or anything, but, uh, uh, and examples of this from uh, industry are widespread. 3M, for years, had provided 15% of time for unstructured 
development, and uh, that's when uh, masking tape and the sticky notes were developed in some of those activities. Uh, Google, as you know, uh, had, has historically provided one day per week to pursue anything, and this is what led to actually Gmail and Google Earth, amongst other things. And so I, th I think it's very important that we try to preserve some academic time um, uh, for our faculty to pursue those interests. Well, the other uh, opportunity for, these, uh, for innovation is through more convergent thinking. And this is uh, through uh, what is, I'd like to refer to as sweat, sadness, and failure, which really means writing grant proposals. <laughs> and uh, this is tough stuff. And uh, it's fraught with you know, challenges. And it's hard, but it gets groups together thinking about difficult problems. And we'll, uh, we'll talk more about that later. But this is really a reflection of not all creative thoughts are these alpha wave driven epiphanies. epiphanies. Uh, and there is this relationship between the working memory in the prefrontal cortex that allows the left brain to become more involved and converge on solutions. And there's really nothing so romantic about this. This is just hard work, uh, but can be very effective as well. And there's uh, more recent data on this that uh, just came out uh, in January, uh, actually in uh, neuroimaging to start with, and then some uh, recent additional work in January, uh, localizing uh, certain areas of the brain, uh, say um, in the uh, uh, frontal gyrus, and that are associated with uh, these um, innovative thought processes and are associated with higher ordinal uh, creative pre people. And these are shown to be more active here in yellow and simultaneously, in this type of a process, there's also suppression of certain areas of the parietal cortex that um, allows some of these, uh, these uh, uh, thoughts to mature. And this is, uh, there's increasing understanding that there's a functional connectivity both between the idea generating areas of the brain as well as the areas that are tossing out the stupid ideas, right? Uh, and, and there's a dynamic interplay between those two areas. And um, so this, I, I like to, to, to call hard work and horizontal sharing. And let me just share an example from my experience with that. And uh, as you know, uh, Hans Wyman developed uh, gadolinium DTPA for MR contrast enhancement. And, uh, 1982. Martin Prince in 1994 proposed um, to do this with contrast enhanced MR angiography. That was on the background of Chuck Mastretta, who's my colleague and uh, Neil's friend here, who invented digital subtraction angiography. Here he's shown with Andy Crummy in the roughly 1980s. And Chuck is the reason why I returned back to Wisconsin, because he was bored with DSA by that time, and we decided to work on MRA techniques together. And so we had started uh, doing some of this work based upon Martin Prince's work and following some of Neil's work in low-dose MR gadolinium imaging. But at the same time, our research group was working on some other things. And in fact, we were um, uh, working uh, on uh, a measure of coronary flow. So. Uh, Martin Prince did his discovery largely through an accident by, make, by mixing up the syringes of gadolinium and saline. And wouldn't that be a you know, patient safety net report now? Well, actually, it led to his realization that if he timed the contrast uh, enhanced MR acquisition to the arrival of contrast, in fact, he could get some pretty good uh, images. Uh, but it was actually a totally a serendipitous uh, result. 
But at the time, uh, this is the kind of stuff we were dealing with. And uh, Neil and I have both showed this case, I think, years ago many times where uh, MR angiography without contrast techniques was fraught with these artifacts here from a metal hip prosthesis and pulse to flow artifacts using the 2D technique. And what Martin proposed was really revolutionary to inject contrast and acquire a 3D image, which really uh, ameliorated all those artifacts. But the problem was we were often faced with these uh, types of issues, these timing artifacts in this case where the contrast hadn't arrived down in the distal abdominal aorta. It looks like there's a huge thrombus in the aorta or in this patient with peripheral vascular disease where the contrast didn't arrive in time to opacify the femoral arteries or in this patient where the uh, rapid return and uh, venous, rapid venous enhancement uh, overlaid the visualization of the arteries and then made it uh, very difficult to um, basically see what we're looking for. And so at this time, I was a young assistant professor in our department, and uh, these cases were often done at night because the neuro people were always using the scanner all day. And um, I would come in and I would get these, uh, these lousy scans that were mistimed. And uh, that wasn't any good. But at the same time, we were working on a grant, uh, working hard to make uh, something else work. And we were enamored with uh, measuring coronary blood flow using phase contrast MRI and calculating coronary flow reserve. This had been a long interest of uh, Chuck Mastretta's, and as I was becoming a cardiac radiologist, this was uh, interesting to me to be able to assess the hemodynamic significance of a stenosis. But it's a really hard problem. These little one millimeter vessels moving around uh, throughout the cardiac cycle and trying to perform phase contrast measurements. At any rate, we we wrote a grant, we actually got the grant, and we started uh, exploring view sharing where uh, we would take some of the signals from one part of the acquisition and share them with other parts of the acquisition within the R to R interval in order to uh, improve our uh, interpolated temporal resolution and to create images throughout the cardiac cycle. And uh, so we were working hard on this view sharing. It was just 2D imaging. And at one point, I got frustrated, kind of had to leave it for a while. And at that moment, uh, I thought, well, gosh, let's, let's do view sharing for 3D imaging during the contrast passage of, during the passage of contrast. So I went back to Chuck Mastretta, said, hey, Chuck, you did this before. Let's do this again. And we came up with this uh, technique for time-resolved imaging of contrast enhancement by view sharing, essentially dividing case space data into multiple different segments, oops, and um, essentially uh, acquiring those segments during the passage of contrast and then uh, reconstruct each time frame by sharing those views. So we traded the temporal footprint for a more dynamic acquisition, and therefore we were able to accelerate the acquisition by about three or fourfold. And uh, notice this is in Green Bay Packer colors, not in red and blue, the standard, but in, in Wisconsin we do this in green and gold. Um, but at any rate, we uh, were able to come up with these time-resolved 3D images by accelerating those, those uh, contrast or those image acquisition curves. And we were able to first, for the first time, um, calculate both a, a time-resolved 3D MRA and a 3D image at the, at the same time. At that time, it took about 12 hours and one graduate student to reconstruct all of the images. And what I, uh, so uh, that's a good example of horizontal sharing, working on another problem and then realizing at some point, wow, these, these issues that we're working on might be applied to a different problem. And uh, I tell Chuck that he's had you know, at least two good ideas in his career, separated by about 20 years, and they're both the same, essentially, um, DSA and some of this time result MRA. Uh, and I think that there's more recent work that suggests that uh, this type of uh, work uh, 
can be predicted in individuals through uh, understanding the networks that connect uh, or that uh, are enhanced or more prominent in those people that are more creative individuals. And this recently was published in PNAS where Beattie and al. looked at the connectivity, the resting state functional connectivity between some of these different areas of the brains and showed that uh, in people who are higher, uh, more creative, they have a certain connection pattern that's different from uh, those individuals that are less creative. So there is a kind of a potential uh, pre-selection. So maybe, uh, Neil, we should start in our faculty interviews, uh, you know, doing a little resting state fMRI uh, to see, you know, how they might fit into the uh, group. Um, so then I think the other thing that I want to comment about individuals and uh, small research groups is the benefit of uh, embracing the outsider. And uh, it's clear that uh, many good ideas come from outsiders when they enter into our field. And our field is filled with natural outsiders. We just don't call them that. We call them young people, right? And they're too young to know any better, and they haven't developed quite as much uh, cynicism as uh, some of us more senior uh, uh, people might have. And uh, we know this based upon literature that's all the way back to uh, Quitlet, a 19th century mathematician, and uh, they looked at productivity, and um, this is in work uh, summarized by Simonton, who also looked at both productivity and creativity, and really plotted this inverted uh, U-shaped curve with a fairly long tail um, in terms of creative uh, productivity. And this has been studied in a number of fields, and uh, including mathematics, astronomy, physics, all which tend to be a little bit earlier on that uh, uh, inverted U-shaped curve, and medicine tends to be a little bit later. And uh, what's a little bit discouraging is when you look at these data uh, with respect to the um, average age of the first R01 NIH grant, which I think is now 45 or something like that, individuals that are 45 years old. So we might be funding people, in fact, average, after some of the, uh, their most productive and creative years. So I think we do need to look at that. But we do know, what we do know about um, this is that team science is definitely the way to go. We saw that a lot today how everybody on those teams had a significant contribution to those teams and that that contribution is really important. And the teams continue to get larger, especially in fields like astronomy that may have you know hundreds of uh, authors on a given paper. And what we know uh, recently, I just saw this uh, in um, the uh, analysis of the grant review process at the NIH, which also showed that the number of uh, authors on publications that cited support from the NIH continues to increase. So we know that uh, team science is effective, so how can we create better teams uh, is the next question. And that's some really interesting social science in, uh, uh, about team assembly and mechanisms and the collaboration network among teams. And, uh, we heard earlier uh, from um, a couple of speakers that have collaborated between the University of Texas at Southwestern and University of Wisconsin, and that's fantastic. And ultimately, I think what it really comes down to is the personal relationships between individuals that are collaborating together. Neil and I have collaborated for years, and it's really great to see uh, our faculty then also reflect that as well. Uh, but there is some science about this, about how we can actually promote creativity amongst those teams. And it, it was uh, 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 proposed by Gumera in this article in Science in 2005. And they studied uh, Broadway musicals from 1887 to 1990. I think there were something like 1,900 Broadway musicals that they studied. And they could categorize them pretty much uh, successfully as those that were uh, fantastic successes and those that were flops, all right? 
And so they looked at all those musicals, and then they looked at the artistic teams that created those musicals. So famous ones like West Side Story and uh, Fiddler on the Roof that were successes, and then uh, I think Gypsy and the Pajama Game were both flops, for example. And they looked at the familiarity amongst the artistic creators of those teams. And they uh, measured something called the Q. This is not the coil Q that Dr. Lenkinski is familiar with, but this is a Q, a measure of social in intimacy. And they also plotted a, an inverted U-shaped curve for that in the sense that if the Q was too low, if those artists had never worked together and uh, weren't very familiar with each other, they tended to struggle to work together. And if the Q was too high, and those artists had uh, worked together too often, there weren't any new ideas. And uh, so there was nothing much new. And so those were also um, kind of not uh, good. So uh, I think it's very important to us that we continue to embrace uh, outsiders into the field to make sure that that cue is optimized. For me uh, personally, excuse me, um, I ran into this in uh, my work early days, and I had to go back to some old material uh, that um, Dr. Linkinski is involved in, actually. Uh, we, I think, first collaborated together in 1986 or so, 1985. And I had done some work. Uh, I met this guy, Jim Hyde, who was a pioneer in uh, electron spin resonance, which is a uh, kind of cousin technology to nuclear magnetic resonance. It uses a different f frequency, but it's essentially the same process only on electrons. And Jim had uh, developed these loop cap resonators, and he's a brilliant ESR kind of scientist and made many contributions. And I went to him as a medical student, and I said, hey, I heard you made these things, and, uh, and uh, yeah, you're a world-famous professor in ESR, but how about making some of these things for MRI or NMR at the time. Couldn't we do that? And, and he said, well, sure, yeah. So we published this uh, paper on resonators for phosphorus NMR at 1.5 T. At that time, you know, we thought high field imaging was going to be all about spectroscopy. Boy, were we wrong. <laughs> Pretty much for the most part. No offense. Uh, uh, Dr. Linkinski or is Craig Malloy here? Or, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of value in spectroscopy, and we thought at that time it was going to change the world, but it didn't. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I got my start doing this, and, and that was helpful. And just one aside, uh, you know, I tr was trying to do that in 1984, uh, so, and today, for the first time, I saw a phosphorus spectrum here from your 7T MR scanner, a phosphorus P31 spectrum. This is one excitation. That is amazing. And um, I don't think this is going anywhere anyway, but uh, <laughs> I, was, I was really impressed. It was amazing. It's like, wow, OK. I finally got, got there. But at any rate, so we had been making those coils and you know, going down to the hardware store and buying parts. There I was with some hair, actually and with Dr. Hyde, and we were in this lab, which is the National Biomedical ESR Center, and it's this building where we were kind of confined, and it actually uh, used to be the uh, detoxification center for the Milwaukee County, all right? So uh, alcoholics would periodically arrive on the steps here, and I was the only a medically trained person. I was the med student working with all these scientists, many of whom were from Poland, or Russia uh, that were into microwave ESR stuff. And so I would get a page when somebody showed up on the doorstep and, uh, and they couldn't be understood and I would escort them to the emergency room which was a block away. And uh, so I got a page one day and here this guy was on the front doorstep. His name is Andrei Yasmanovich. And it turns out he's a Polish scientist, and his English was already, always terrible. And when I asked his brother about whether his Polish is, you know, w whether his English was always uh, that bad, he said, yes, and his Polish is just as bad. Uh, but he was somewhat hard, but he was a brilliant scientist. And uh, in fact, he immigrated to Milwaukee because 
He was the guy, um, who remembers Lech Walesa and the Solidarity Movement, which essentially brought down the Soviet Union, all right? Um, and uh, so they would organize these strikes at the shipyards in Poland. And uh, Lech Walesa got people together and they would broadcast a message, all right, we're gonna do a strike at this time at this shipyard. And um, Andre was the guy building these radio transmitters in hot air balloons, hooked up to a recorder that would have Lech Walesa broadcast a message. And they could never track down where these messages were coming from. And Andre uh, was a scientist that did this. And um, then one day, he was actually out of the country at a conference in Britain, and he got an anonymous phone call in his hotel room saying, they found out it was you. Don't come back to Poland. And he immigrated through Canada to Milwaukee, and he's working at a TV repair shop in Milwaukee. And uh, Jim Hyde found him there uh, when uh, Andre was the only guy who could fix his broken TV. And he said, hey, you know, come on over. You know something about this. So it was actually Andre that um, really led to us starting to work in other areas of MRI and to start developing all of these surface coils for MRA, which turned out to be a really good um, opportunity to translate basic research into clinical practice. And that's when I really started to understand how uh, powerful that could be when you could actually see the results of what you did in a clinical patient that uh, you were treating. And this led to the formation of a company and a, a lot of other work in the area. And uh, Andrei Yasmanovich, I think, was the key element. He was quite an outsider. We could hardly understand him, but he's a brilliant scientist. And uh, he subsequently became a full professor and a, um, a fellow of the ISMRM as well. He's, he's passed away a few years ago. I think the other message here in terms of diversity of teams is to, uh, we really need to collectively think about diversity also, in, not only in terms of uh, where we come from around the world and promoting ways of people to come in from around the world to join us, but also looking at the, the nature of the makeup of our teams in terms of gender diversity as well. And that's been shown to uh, promote innovation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what we can do as leaders in medical imaging, as well as uh, for the trainees who are evaluating where they might go. Uh, these are things you might consider in terms of areas that you work or how you choose what your uh, next areas of work might be. And uh, we can promote kind of an open source environment, create urban fiction, tap uh, difficult problems, and uh, get in the flow. So first of all, in terms of the open source, I use a broad definition, and any computer scientist probably will correct me. This is not the correct definition of open source. But you know, at a certain time when MR scanners and CT scanners were just being developed, computers uh, were primarily the mini computers, right? And, and they were almost, uh, by definition, all the companies were all based in Boston. But they were very um, closed to uh, collaboration, and there was a lot of proprietary hardware and software that were unique to each company. And uh, that, in fact, proved to not be a very successful strategy because none of the collaborators could really uh, collaborate with each other, which engineers are really generally interested in doing. And uh, so, in fact, a lot of the computer interest industry moved west where there was a more of an open, collaborative environment uh, to work. And the same thought uh, could, or the same process could have been a problem in MRI. At that time, the manufacturers of imaging equipment were very closed. CT, ultrasound, and to some extent, X-ray devices were very closed. And uh, we couldn't program them. But um, it was really Felix Worley who can Maury Blumenfeld at GE, that a lot of the knowledge in NMR was outside of the manufacturers, but it was in these really brilliant chemists and spectroscopists that had the content knowledge in NMR, like Dr. Linkinski. 
And I think this is an older photo of you in the front of a GE scanner. Uh, and um, the, uh, the fact is that uh, at that time they made a critical decision that uh, we were gonna, they were going to open this up and create a research platform on the GE scanner and uh, Philips and Siemens and the other manufacturers, I think, followed suit, recognizing that, okay, we've got to leverage this intellectual environment outside of the company. And uh, uh, Maury Blumenfeld, who was one of the pioneers in uh, early uh, dissemination of MRI, uh, stated the value became evident when Dick Eman and some of his colleagues came to GE to show us how to eliminate uh, pulsating uh, artifacts from pulsating blood, and Dick Eman is widely credited with, credited with uh, the SAT pulses that we all use every day, and pretty much ignore. So um, the the I think what we can take home on this is uh, we need to continue to build these tools in this toolbox to share data and to share uh, tools for us to work with uh, imaging, and and so I'm very encouraged. Whoops. Uh, by the fat and water collaboration activities and the toolbox that's being built by uh, those uh, in that area. The other thing we can do is create urban friction and look for places that we see this. And I was really excited today to see that there are uh, physicists embedded next to radiologists in your lab area here. And the labs are close to the leadership offices. And faculty are close to um, uh, other engineers and chemists and graduate students. And, and that's, that's great. And I think that is recapitulating what I would call that urban friction. And this is um, based on some similar social sciences data. Lewis Betancourt studied basically why are cities, why do they work? We take all these people and um, he was able to show that actually the creativity went uh, and was scaled by the population times 1.05. So there was a greater advantage in these urban environments where there's a lot of interactions, friction, and criticism. And uh, so we can do this. It's known that if we just do brainstorming, that doesn't necessarily work. You need that critical process as well. And it's the imperfection of ideas that cause us to listen. And so in our societies, I think something like the annual meeting of the ISMRM, that's like the New York City of MRI, uh, but it's also these workshops and study groups that are very valuable, which create that uh, more Greenwich Village-like uh, uh, creative environment. And uh, so we continue to try to support that in the ISMRM by providing uh, grants for students to attend these workshops because uh, it's really an area where um, students can have more direct access to the faculty and I think we need to continue to do things like this. And um, there's been scientific work to suggest that yes, there is a lot of value in uh, looking, in co-locating scientists from different disciplines. And I think I'm not going to go into this in, this in detail, but Lee and coworkers uh, proved that the impact, as measured by the number of citations of papers, went up when we tried to co-locate individuals. And they studied the uh, Boston area uh, scientific collaboration in the healthcare campus. So what we've done at Wisconsin is similar to what you've tried to do here. This is our our medical campus, the hospital here, the uh, uh, health, uh, the learning uh, center there, VA over here, and when we built um, our Imaging Sciences Research Center, where imaging is the uh, bottom two floors of this and a wedge and another floor of here, and there's, there's other research activities like uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer, other foci of research elsewhere in these buildings. We wanted imaging to be the basis for this as well as to create a, a reason for people to come down to the imaging center to have those random interactions, and that's why we put coffee right in the middle of it all. Okay, and then finally, I just want to say uh, what can we do uh, as departments, and that I think is, I'd say, get in the flow and encourage these group alpha waves. And um, this guy with this impossibly difficult pronounced name, Chicken Santamali, um, has this theory of 
flow, that when we get in the flow state, um, which is a unique uh, uh, kind of line of regression here, where our skills and our challenges are plotted, and if our challenges exceed our skills too much, we get anxious. If uh, our skills are way higher than the challenges that we face, that's boredom. And so to get in this sweet spot is really important. And uh, well, for example, I like to windsurf. Um, this would be kind of boring there. Uh, this would be a little too exciting uh, there. Uh, uh, too much of a challenge, uh, but to get in the flow state is, is really critical. And, and for me, uh, personally, um, I like to have something that's completely different than work periodically to get in that flow state, like skiing or mountain biking or windsurfing. I think for Neil, it might be playing music. And for uh, those uh, trainees in the audience, I think it's really good to have that balance uh, something that gets you completely off of uh, work. And, uh, oh, well, there's Neil himself jamming here. And uh, there is some data here also that there's some neural substrates for spontaneous musical performance. Uh, and there, uh, Lim and Brown did a study using fMRI to kind of understand this flow state. And here again, uh, it, uh, I think what we know is that there's this dyna dynamic interplay of activity in certain areas of the prefrontal cortex and then suppression of other areas that ordinarily suppress some of our, uh, or are the more critical thought areas of our brain. And um, so I, I think this is a, a really healthy thing to do for us as individuals, but I think it's something we can also promote um, amongst our teams and our departments. And the example I take from here just in the last few minutes is uh, picking really hard problems and charging a group with attacking that problem. So the one I like to use is uh, phase contrast MR. We saw some work with the 4D flow earlier today. And we've been working with that, I'd, I'd say, for about now uh, 18 years or so. And at the time when we started the acquisitions using conventional acquisition techniques, if we wanted to reconstruct a cardiac gated 3D flow acquisition, which uh, gives us a multi dimensional flow uh, exam, um, the acquisition times using uh, conventional techniques were 40 minutes to four hours potentially, which of course are clinically impractical. And uh, it is at one of our fishing meetings that uh, Chuck Mastretta here came up with this idea, completely for a different reason, but uh, here, here is Scott Reeder there, uh, somewhere I'm in there. This is a meeting that we all go up to Canada, radiologists and uh, medical physicists and engineers. We give lectures to each other in the morning, and then we fish all day, and then we give lectures in the afternoon. And during those fishing times, there's often some really good uh, ideas that are generated and, the, um, and during the lectures. Here, Fred Lee started a company and recently sold that to Johnson & Johnson for fractions of a billion dollars. And you know, that, that kind of came up at this, uh, some of these ideas came up at these fishing meetings. So it's been well worth it uh, on many levels. And uh, here, Chuck, at that time, you know, uh, we were talking about something else. He said, well, why don't we use a radial projection reconstruction? That the spatial resolution is kind of independent of the number of samples. And uh, if it's a sparse data set, we can uh, kind of undersample it and then accelerate the imaging, basically. And he was actually thinking of CT colonography, which didn't make any sense. But for MR phase contrast, it did make a lot of sense. And so we developed these techniques using undersampled projection reconstruction. Here's just a comparison using um, a conventional techniques about a seven minute acquisition. And then now a seven minute acquisition gives us whole brain coverage. And uh, this coupled with the you know, ability, the enhanced ability to process these 4D flow um, acquisitions has really uh, allowed us to take what was once a very difficult problem and now translate that into clinical practice. And it has been a complete uh, group effort, uh, not only at UW, but also in collaboration with Michael Markle at Freiburg and University of Illinois. 
I mean, uh, in Northwestern uh, University in Illinois. And um, I think from my perspective as a radiologist, it is really exciting to be able to see this and to be able to witness the translation of that basic science idea all the way to our clinical practice to benefit one of our patients. And uh, this was the first clinical case that I actually interpreted in a patient with a type B aortic dissection with persistent pain and ischemia. And we did this 4D flow measurement, which you can appreciate that uh, the flow through the true lumen is very high. And then during most of the cardiac cycle during diastole, the true lumen is completely obliterated by the back pressure from the false lumen. Uh, we really couldn't figure out with conventional CTA what exactly was the problem with this particular patient. And it was a 4D flow that allows us to convince the surgeons that it was this process that was taking place and the patient was treated with an endo endovascular uh, stent graft and the and the uh, uh, abnormalities were corrected. So I think that we ought not to take it for granted that we as radiologists really have a unique capability to see that whole uh, process from basic discovery to implementation in clinical practice. And it's something that, uh, that I personally cherish and uh, we should continue to support. So in summary, uh, in terms of enhancing innovation as individuals, we can make time for alpha ways. Uh, remember that uh, hard work and horizontal sharing, even though it seems painful at the time, often can yield really good results. And then embrace the outsider in our research groups. As uh, leaders of radiology teams, I think we need to continue to embrace this open source environment, create uh, urban friction, and uh, to really embrace internationalism as well, which is incredibly important, and to identify you know, those hard topics, those stretch goals that our teams often, even if they don't achieve those goals, can really achieve something else. If we do that, uh, I think we will improve human health for centuries to come. I want to acknowledge my colleagues at UW and spend a brief moment uh, shameless advertising for you trainees. Come on up. It might be a little cold. The summers are really nice. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of great things going. And um, we are located right here, the capital of Wisconsin, up in Madison. We are right next to the university campus on an isthmus between two lakes, a geographic uh, structure and uh, it combines this wonderful kind of campus feel with um, the state capital and our, our beautiful lakes. So come on up and visit. And uh, that's the end of my shameless recruiting, <laughs> except I will just add one other little tidbit that uh, this year Aunt Minnie uh, named us the best uh, radiologist training program. Um, unseating UCSF, who had been winning this award for many years. It was my pleasure to give uh, Ron Aronson that news. And uh, we have many fellowships. So thank you very much for your attention, and thanks for hosting me. So uh, I want to thank Tom and, and, uh, and uh, present him with a small token of our appreciation for your time spent here for a terrific lecture where you brought together so many disciplines. I'm thinking about, we saw fMRI, um, we saw social sciences, we saw a little geography there, we saw <laughs> uh, shameless, uh, you know, plugging for a program, um, many, many skills that I'm not well versed <laughs> as. <laughs> but really, Tom, thanks for a terrific inspirational talk, provocative. Uh, and entertaining, really appreciate right, it. Thank Thanks you. for being part of today. <laughs> I'd just like to make some closing remarks. Um, Research Day has uh, been such a wonderful addition to our program, and uh, I would say that that Craig really articulated it well in the beginning when he stated that this program is meeting our hopes and dreams as we initially uh, 
thought of this program as we initially conceived of it. And, you know, it's really wonderful to set an aspiration, to set a big vision, to have a little audacity in that vision, and to watch it come to fruition. And today is an example of that. The quality of the research, the abundance of the research, um, well, I, you know, it gives me such pride to look out on all of you here, all the participants, uh, and to know that you're part of a great program uh, and you make it great. And for that, I am very, very thankful. Uh, today, as a special day, I'd like to just offer a few thanks. Um, there's no way we can have such an event without the contributions of many people. So the committee behind the scenes that's doing so much, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Cristala Edwards, Irene Delgado, John Guerin, Lindsay Gilson, Stacy McElroy, Nicole Paul, Ursula Taylor, Pamela White, Latoya Wright, Sonia Hill, Jocelyn Shafolius, Glenn Katz, Alandis Young, and Melody Reeves. The judges play an important part. Uh, Lakshmi Anantakrishnan, Tim Booth, uh, Bashak Dogan, Ivan Pedrosa, Marco Pino, Shankai Sun, and Elena Vinogradov. Um, really have to acknowledge Craig and Bob for spearheading this terrific day. But frankly, the special thanks do have to go to Bob Linkinski because this is his conception and it's his creativity and his passion for science and mentorship that has really uh, been responsible for this wonderful day that we all share and enjoy. And so I'd like to thank you all, but why don't I give a special thank you What I neglected to do is to give Tom an opportunity to, to answer some questions. So do we have some questions, perhaps, for, for Tom? So I often felt um, sort of like an outsider in research and through my career. And I noticed that when I was watching your, your presentation, it was pretty much all male, you know, throughout time. And I don't, is there an ISMRM female gold medal winner? Hedy? Yes. Hetty won, right? Yeah, Hetty and Joan Ingwall, I think. John, yep. and, and, and Carla? I think Carla won. Oh, and three. Uh, okay. But yeah. anyway, how, what do yeah. you do in your program, in your place to, you know, embrace the outsider, make sure you've got your young women faculty and your younger people of color or someone, you know, who just d thinks differently or looks differently than you? How do you uh, encourage your group to make those kind of teams? Yeah, right. That's a really good question. Um, and I think that uh, there's, a, there's a few things. I think uh, women in uh, science and medicine, uh, often at a very critical time of their career, are also um, facing other uh, things at home, you know, perhaps trying to raise a family and uh, feeling um, like uh, the time is of a critical element. And so um, I know that some radiology practices don't allow part-time people. I think that's a terrible mistake because I think people ought to be able to adjust. And so we promote that or allow that when necessary and try to, um, uh, try to encourage a, a balanced view of that. And some of my part-time women faculty are some of the most productive faculty we have. Um, and I sometimes get worried that uh, they're doing too much work off the clock. And so yeah, that yeah, also, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> you're right. You can be stronger than you. Yeah, right, like we, we all are. But uh, yeah, that's, that's an issue. But um, I think also uh, identifying role models and uh, who have been through that experience. And as, as time goes on, there are more uh, role models, and that's, that's really good. You, you know some of them. Um, we also have promoted a uh, women in radiology interest group that has actually uh, developed a whole uh, kind of professionalism program, not just for women, but 
for everybody in the department. And it kind of, uh, it, it helps us by bringing a different perspective to everybody in the department. Um, but I certainly don't have the, the answer. And we're, we're trying hard, um, especially with, uh, in faculty in the uh, medical physics, engineering, and um, those uh, harder sciences, it's, it's been tough. Yes, Lakshmi. at the, the side of the gold medalists, and um, my chairman when I was a resident was one of them, uh, Mike Modick, and he always used to talk about the good old days where they could just throw somebody on the scanner or throw whatever, you know, yeah. time wasn't an issue, as much regulation wasn't an issue, and now um, the, not to, uh, patient safety and patient privacy are obviously extremely important concerns, mm -hmm. but it seems like there's a lot more red tape, if you will, to um, to getting research done. Um, so I guess my thoughts are, my, my question is, what, what are your thoughts on current day climate as far as reg, as far as regulation and whether that has hampered in, uh, creativity? Yeah, right. It's a good question. I think, uh, actually I sense that the uh, regulatory environment uh, pendulum swung one way to uh, really uh, suppress and, and create a, a very difficult processes uh, and to suppress some of the pace of innovation. My sense is that's swinging back a little bit. Um, I won't get political, uh, but maybe there's something there. Uh, but in our hands, I think as uh, in the last 10 years, one of our biggest challenges has been these academic industrial partnerships and the regulation around conflict of interest and conflict of commitment and the impact that that has on research studies. And I think that pendulum had really swung, mostly driven by the manufacturers' interpretations of rules. That seems to be coming back. And uh, I think we've, um, we've worked with our you know, IRB to try to bring it back. It is a problem elsewhere. There seems to be a lot of variation from uh, site to site and, and how vigorous the IRBs are and, and how, uh, how restricted the conflict of interest committees are and um, those, those things. So I don't know. I think er all of that is probably local and there are a lot of variations, but I do feel like it's coming back a little bit. Yes. Let's just get a mic on it, Afnish. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was a fantastic talk. I mean, I learned a lot about team science. It's, it's great to see University of Wisconsin collaborating with our department. My experience has been different. It's a controversial thing. So I've gone all over the country in the last 10 years, I would say eight years, and established protocols for NYU, Brigham, all these places. I've scanned patients for them. But next time when you meet these guys in the meetings, if I've established something for, say, UK, I gave a webinar yesterday, and they invite you, and they'll say, you know, we are giving a webinar, but we'll like Abnish also to talk in there. While in the US, all these people you meet in the meetings, they'll say, oh, Abnish, we are almost there to compete with you. That's kind of response on the face. Hmm. So how good are radiologists collaborating? So that's my concern there. I think that, again, is probably, uh it comes down to personal relationships. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there are areas that I can point to, like in the 4D flow stuff. Yes, we are probably competing with University of Freiburg and then Northwestern University when Michael Markle moved there. But uh, you know, ultimately, I think if you focus on what's in the best interest of the patient in the long run, that that stuff will sort itself out. And so I guess, if I s sense that two teams are competing, I'll ask them to just focus, all right, how can we get this technology or how can we move this field forward as fast as possible to uh, benefit human health, which is what we're all trying to do. So um, yeah, maybe I agree that's with a that message. Point, but I see resistance from radiologists. Like, I don't know, it's a physician thing or. Huh. Thank you. So Tom, I, I have a comment about that. I mean, I agree with you that relationships matter, but, but the uh, funding system matters a lot, too. 
So in Europe, there's an encouragement for multi-center collaborative uh, trials. They, they actually, the European Union supports them. You'll find many institutions collaborate with each other in team science. Here, we're individual competitors. Yeah. And right. so we always feel like we're competing for the same grant dollars. And so a, uh, a culture grows up where sharing may look like it's antithetical to that when, in fact, it isn't. Mm -hmm. And so that's a hard thing to overcome when you're looking at individual accounts versus what teams can produce. Yeah, and balancing those two things off is really a challenging effort in the United States. Right. And I think that uh, we, even the academic environment, uh, continues to support that individualism rather than the team teamwork. And I think we need to develop promotion mechanisms that recognize that, all right, uh, each of us may have a different contribution that's significant, but may not reflect, all right, developing your own lab as the PI. It was one more there. I, I thank you very much for a very uh, great uh, overview of uh, creativity and different things. My question is, often we, uh, there is this critique of current funding principles that most creative ideas that truly disrupt will not get funded, not in the initially, and there are very few mechanisms that really promote uh, something outside of the system. So what do you think of that? And in general, how do you think it's possible to bring together these great uh, hot shower relax moments with uh, blood, greed, and uh, of NIH review process. Uh, it's yeah. impossible to. Yeah. I think there again, you know, balancing. There's uh, different times for each approach. You're going to have the sweat and blood, sweat, and tears, I guess, with the NIH. Uh, but making sure you take some time after that grant is in to, you know, uh, make time for alpha waves. Uh, Do you think our current uh, climate helps with innovation and uh, really creative ideas? Or because many times it comes back from the study section saying, oh, there's not pre enough preliminary data, there's not enough uh, you know, pre existing. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, it seems to me that some of the most successful NIH funded investigators, they, they've already had the work done when they submit the grant, and the grant is really for the next grant, right, or the next body of work. And so, you know, unfortunately, that's the way it is. I think, g given that, though, it's, we still have this incredible uh, NIH process for delivering money that I hope, you know, is maintained, you know, because it really is troubling when I heard from somebody, oh, it was uh, Yvonne, you know, 11 percentile on a grant and it, you know, didn't get funded. You think, oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, that that's that's tough, and and the, it becomes a signal and noise problem because there's so much noise in the in the evaluation process. I think where this what I'm really a, a little bit worried about maybe an opportunity though is the pace of change is now going so fast with some of the um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning in imaging, and. Wow, that is going way faster than our review process or evaluation process can possibly keep up. And some of those uh, ideas will be old ideas by the time they get to the, you know, review committee. I, that's in the, in the next couple of years, that's kind of what I'm worried about is how we invest in that, but at the same time do it at a pace that matches the pace of innovation. Any more questions? If not, join me once again in uh, congratulating Tom for a great and stimulating talk. And thank you, everyone. We're adjourned. Have a great evening.